from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working with students and families to improve college access and student success for a better West Virginia. Good evening and welcome to the Legislature Today, I'm Andrea Lanham. Tonight, a special focus on West Virginia's opioid epidemic and the legislation being drafted here at the State House to address the crisis on multiple fronts. Joining me tonight are House Health and Human Resource Committee, Chairman Delegate Joe Ellington and member of the Senate Health and Human Resources Committee, Senator Ron Stallings. Both are physicians. Thank you both for being here. We begin with a trip to southern West Virginia to hear firsthand of the tragic toll the epidemic is taking. Reporter Jessica Lilly traveled to Kermit in Mingo County, the first town in the country to file suit against large pharmaceutical companies for flooding their community with opioids. Nestled in the Appalachian Mountains, deep in the coal fields of southern West Virginia, the town of Kermit is home to about 400 people. The town has a couple Mexican restaurants, several churches, a few stores, a local pizza joint, and now a label of ground zero for the opioid epidemic. A Pulitzer Prize winning report from the Charleston Gazette found that pharmaceutical companies flooded Kermit with more than 12 million hydrocodone tablets between 2007 and 2012. The ratio of pills to people is staggering, about 30,000 pills for each Kermit resident. A faltering economy in the wake of a downturn in the coal industry has left the town vulnerable. So you have to have, one, a doctor willing to prescribe. Two, you have to have a pharmacy willing to dispense. And we found that in Kermit. We found uh, that there were pharmacies willing to dispense them and they were dispensing large amounts. So you have people with legitimate scripts that are obviously going in and they need the script legitimately. You have people that have lost their jobs. They have a sense of hopelessness. Uh, idle time and they also end up trying to escape reality and they turn to drugs. Then you also have people that just can't make a living right now. They don't have a job or what have you and they start diverting. When you have a pill that'll sell from anywhere from thirty to a hundred dollars you know you can go down and get a thirty day script and you get it on Medicaid or Medicare, you have insurance, you can make a large amount of money from these pills. So we see obviously the pills being diverted. So all these things have to have a line. When you look at Kermit you don't see, you know, that's a small area, a small population, but when you have a, everything lining up, you have people coming from different states, from different areas, all to that one area in order to tame their prescriptions. Talk to some of the people here, and you'll find some who have seen the changes since the glory days of the now consolidated Kermit High School, home of the Blue Devils. In a sense, it, we died, in a sense, because, you know, I think drug addiction and problems have, there's somebody that we all know that it's affected, but this little town with the population of 400, that, I mean, you know, it, it's just not the same. It's still a good town, and it still has very, very good people in it, but it's not the town that I grew up in. We started answering a lot more calls, first responders, and uh, we used to one, two, three responders a week, and then all of a sudden it pops up 10, 15 first responder calls a week, you know, and just gradually kept going up and you hit, all of a sudden it just hits you right there, what's going on, you know? We're starting to answer so many more calls and, and a lot of calls we were answering on first responder calls was uh, drug overdose or drug related, you know? Wilburn Priest is the Kermit Volunteer Fire Chief. He also goes by Tomahawk. The station serves all of Kermit, parts of Mingo County, and even parts of neighboring Wayne County. And now he and his crew do it with one less person on the team his assistant fire chief. I lost a brother that overdosed about uh, four months ago. And uh, I was the first, I got called out on a first responder call and I was the first one on scene. And uh, it really blew my mind. He was my assistant chief here and he's my younger brother. And uh, when I got there, you know, I started CPR and stuff, but uh, then uh, I had help arrived shortly after that and we hit him with the AED and everything and, uh, 
he just didn't come around. And uh, I thought maybe my brother had a heart heart attack. He had uh, he had uh, health problems and stuff. So uh, we had an autopsy done and come to find out it wasn't. It was overdose on the cocaine and uh, meth. My brother, you can talk to anybody in the county. The county even took a, a big loss. He was a master diver. And uh, on the, the jaws of life and all, he was, a, he was just a born natural at it. And people would tell you, if I was ever in a car wreck, I want him there to cut me out. Wilburn's brother, Timmy Dale Priest, was the youngest son in a family of 13 brothers and sisters. Wilburn says his brother saved many lives during his 54 years, including some who were trapped during the devastating floods that ravaged southern West Virginia in 2016. Timmy Dale led the rescue mission in Raynell. Fourteen boats went to Raynell. The Kermit Fire Department had one of the boats there. And when my boys pulled in, everybody kind of, you know, they made fun of my boys. They didn't have the right equipment and everything, and uh, they stopped at Dick's Sporting Goods on the way and bought bicycle helmets for swift water helmets. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they got there, there was, uh, I think it was 42 people saved in the town of Raynell. My one boat with those four guys saved 28 of them. <laughs> and they left there with high respects. And I'm sure you miss him. Oh, God, do I. It's hard. It really is. I miss him more every day, too. It's just, every call we get, I used to have him there with, on my side and stuff, but I don't have him now. Timmy Dale had apparently relapsed. He had battled drugs before. Wilburn says he was injured in a car accident when he was 14 and ended up doctor shopping for pain pills. After his brother died, he pushed to get the opioid overdose reversal medicine naloxone at the Kermit Fire Station. While naloxone wouldn't have saved his brother, Wilburn hoped he could save someone else's life. In just six weeks, Priest says he administered three doses and saved three lives. You're talking about somebody's kid. You know, no matter what, it's somebody's kid. You know, somebody's uh, son, somebody's brother, or sister, or whatever. If you can save their life, save. Now, you might turn their life around. They might see what happened. They may not, and they go right back. But that's a chance you have to take. But if I can save somebody's life, no matter what I have to do, I'll save them. Priest says the lawsuit has brought new hope to folks in the region. He hopes to keep the resources to stock naloxone, maybe build a recovery center close by, and a new community center for the kids. Something that says they aren't giving up on their town or their children's future. Even with, with all the bad, no, this was home, and I, and I, and I do believe there's, I do believe there's, there's hope. There's hope. So, you know, I mean, we've got good people, and if you've got good people and people that are willing to work together and try to combat, you know, things that are thrown your way, I, I, I'm not saying it could be the picturesque town that it was back in the 70s when I was growing up, but I have hope. During a federal hearing in Cleveland earlier this month, Judge Dan Polster argued that the crisis is 100 percent man-made. He said he believes everyone, from drug makers to doctors to individuals, share some responsibility for the crisis and haven't done enough to stop it. The judge also urged participants in lawsuits against drug makers and distributors to work toward a common goal of reducing overdose deaths. For the Legislature Today, I'm Jessica Lilly in Kermit. We reached out to the pharmaceutical companies and other defendants named in the Kermit lawsuit for a statement. You'll find those responses on our website at wvpublic.org. Again, joining us this evening, House Health Committee Chairman Delegate Joe Ellington and member of the Senate Health and Human Resources Committee, Senator Ron Stallings. Thank you both for being here. Good to be here. Now, let's just start with a reaction to the piece that we just watched, which puts a face to this tragedy. Again, both of you are doctors. You've both seen it firsthand. Well, we've all seen it firsthand. Well, it's uh, all too common, unfortunately. Uh, and it's, again, it's not just your, what you would consider a druggie, but it impacts everyone that could have substance use disorder or addiction. And it's, that's why we are all working so hard to try to combat this. 
Delegate, what's your reaction? I would agree. It, it does affect a lot of people, it, not just the immediate families, but extended families and whole communities, and really for the state as a whole, because it is a problem that's widespread throughout every part of this state. Now we have a graphic showing the numbers of overdoses per county in 2016, the most comprehensive numbers that we have out there right now. We've heard it said before, the opioid crisis has been decades in the making and it's going to take decades to fix. Certainly there's the long-term systematic changes that have to be made, but there's also the triage that what we have to address right now, and both are difficult. Delegate, what do you think? Yeah. It is, a, it's a widespread problem. There are many facets to it, so you have to attack it at different ways. And that's something we've been trying to do over the past several years. But you're right, it's going to take many years to, to, uh, to try to correct that and turn it around. There is no quick fix to it. The, um, again, we have gone after the supply end of this issue. I guess you would call that the low-lying fruit to the point now where uh, we are prescribing and, and there's less than 50% of the opioids being prescribed today than there were uh, three years ago. Uh, and I can tell you that the upcoming legislation really targets, as do the new guidelines, national guidelines, the new starts, the new starts, so that we're going to, it's going to be a very careful patient selection process, risk um, factor evaluation before you'd ever start someone that's not on opioids, on opioids. Uh, and again, I think there is some fear that people that have been taking pain medicine for 20 some years, they have a fear that they're no longer going to be able to get their medicine that they're uh, you know, using for legitimate reasons, uh, that are passing urine drug screens, that are not doctor shopping, but have you know significant pain. And so I think what we're trying to do is, uh, is a delicate balance here where we uh, can uh, really cut down on the supply and still yet not throw the baby out with the bathwater, if you would, because we know that people that have chronic severe pain, uh, if they don't have some treatment for that, then the suicide risk goes up, et cetera. So let's talk about that legislation. You've been working on the Opioid Reduction Act over interims. There are several components to that, so let's break that down. What does this bill do? Chairman Ellen Well, the first part is limiting, uh, as, as the Senator Stallings mentioned, we're trying to limit the, the amount of uh, narcotics that are out in the public. So when people come in with acute pain, we're trying to identify if they need to be on an opiate or some other modality. And for people with chronic problems, we still have to treat these problems. People are going to have that. So we can't, we don't want the pendulum to swing the opposite way where we can't take care of our patients. So I think we're trying to do a better, better uh, thing with trying to educate our providers and also educate the patients so they know what other alternatives are out there. So the first part is really cutting down on the amount of medications that are prescribed, the types that are prescribed, look at alternatives. And then for longer term type uh, treatments, um, look at as far as some type of mechanism to follow that to make sure you're still continuing the right, the right course. Um, of course, the other thing that comes into effect is other medications, not necessarily that are legal medications, but other drugs that people are turning to as we've cut the supply off of prescription medications. Um, this bill doesn't address that portion of it, but that, that's something else we'll have to work on. And there's a pharmacy tracking part of this bill too, right? Yeah, the prescription drug monitoring program uh, really is a great tool in the toolbox for us. Uh, you can do everything from making sure that your patients are not doctor shopping, and we have to access that. We have to do it if we're prescribing medicine. Uh, before you start a medication, and then ever so ap often after that. Uh, we want to limit the number of uh, pills that someone gets uh, in an emergency room setting or urgent care setting or post-op setting to, uh, you know, three days or seven days, something like that, because we know that people can, actually some people can get addicted after a few days of therapy. Uh, we're going to be using this uh, prescription drug monitoring program in a better way. They're going to improve it so that it's real time. That's always been an issue. Uh, and then try to coordinate that with across state boundaries as well because you know what's going on in Kentucky or Ohio may not be able to you may not be able to access that in West Virginia but I share the concern that when you push in the envelope or the balloon in one area it comes out in another and we are seeing that in a pretty dramatic fashion I think uh, regarding the heroin 
and carfentanil and method, uh, methamphetamine laced with carfentanil. And so, you know, we are going after the low hanging fruit, which is the supply end. And I really, uh, it's gonna take a lot more money and a lot more effort, a lot more policing, if you would, to go after that heroin because what the uh, medical examiner office is finding is that people are dying of heroin, but they also happen to have, you know, hydrocodone or, or Neurontin or gabapentin or Xanax in their system. So again, we can't stick our chest out too much saying, oh, we're doing all this great stuff when people are, are still overdosing on heroin or something. So it is a huge, complicated issue. The, the other part I'd like to add, too, is with decreasing the amounts that are prescribed to patients, you don't have all those medications sitting in someone's drug cabinet, uh, medicine cabinet. That way, other family members or other people that may have access to that don't get a hold of it. Because that's one of the things that when people prescribe large amounts for chronic pain, that's where things uh, would go missing, and that's what gets out into the community. Uh, so we're trying to limit that part, too. And the, we also are trying to tie in from the Board of Pharmacy as far as the uh, database, being able to flag different uh, practices that some physicians that may be outliers prescribing too many things or patients that are, doc like as Senator Stallings mentioned, uh, doctor shopping, it alerts the uh, medical board so that they can at least look at those things and, and, and make sure that uh, things are legitimate. Now can we look around the country and identify something somewhere that's really making a difference anywhere in the country, just anything that's working? I'll start with you, Senator. Well, I think we're at the cutting edge. I think we've really realized we've had a, pro a problem for a long time and we're really, uh, I think, uh, probably uh, you know, being uh, looked at by other countries. But I think limiting those first-time prescriptions to either three days or seven days is something that we're not number one in, we're probably going to be about number six in. Uh, but uh, again, I, it's uh, in West Virginia, you know, our economy is not diversified and it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge. And so I think uh, if we can improve our economy, that we can also deal with this uh, drug issue as well. And I would agree. As our economy picks up opportunities for people, uh, then that gives them the opportunity to at least be um, not only responsible, but to, to be very productive. And I think when you have people that are, whether they're, if they're unemployed, they don't have anything to look forward to, uh, times are down on them, people turn to other alternatives. And uh, uh, pain is exacerbated, medications and other things. We see that with alcohol, we see that with other, other drugs. And uh, so as that changes, we may see that improve. But to go back to your point about other parts of the country, we do try to learn from best practices from other areas that people have studied. Behavioral health is one of the things we've tried to look at our insurance coverage for that to help get people into primary care. That way it helps prevent them getting into uh, having other problems. We've looked at the neonatal abstinence centers uh, across the country and we've initiated that here in this state too to help prevent um, neonatal abstinence problems and uh, well babies, well, and well moms. Um, good parenting. Uh, so all of those things we're trying to uh, look at is from the prevention standpoint and also from the treatment standpoint. Now, Senator, what's the most controversial part of this bill? Uh, I, I think uh, the oversight, you know, I think it might uh, make physicians paranoid about, you know, prescribing pain medicines. I think there's a fear that uh, some doctors will just say, look, I'm not going to prescribe pain medicine anymore, uh, in which case, you're going to miss legitimate patients who really need that. Uh, that's one. I think that's probably something that we have to be the most careful about. Yeah, I would agree. As we said, the pendulum swing in the opposite way. You don't want people not to get treated, and then you're only going to have a few people that'll take care of those patients, and that really puts a, an excessive load on those those providers. Yeah. Part of the issue is we don't have a lot of pain management specialist in West Virginia and the ones that are here are the in interventional type where they do injections in their back. Uh, most of the uh, treatment is being done in a primary care setting. So, uh, and, and one of the biggest issues in my mind is one, when you find someone that has that substance use disorder that we find out that they are addicted, uh, you know, what do you do with them? And there's no easy way to get them into recovery. Uh, a lot of the medication-assisted programs are full or, or too expensive, and so 
once I stop someone's medicine because they failed a urine drug screen, that's a critical time. And I've had a couple patients that end up overdosing because they weren't able to get into recovery in a timely manner. So what isn't the bill addressing? Chairman Ellington, I'll start with you. Well, it's not a cure-all. As we said, it's trying to look at providers and the, um, the amounts of uh, narcotics that are being put out into the community from the prescription standpoint. Uh, there are other parts we have to look at as far as scheduling of different drugs, classifications. That's going to probably be a separate bill that we'll be looking at. It doesn't uh, address uh, treatment centers. It doesn't uh, address identification of, uh, of potential patients. It does to some extent when we look at initial encounters uh, and then also through the database as far as seeing if there's someone at risk that we need to, to, to uh, see. But uh, there are a lot of other areas that we have to go to. And, uh, but this is mainly on the, on the prescription side of it. So we're discussing how we design policy and spend money, invest money to fight this epidemic. Is there an expanded role or responsibility within Medicaid? And will they get additional funds to do that? Well, I, I think so. From uh, what the president had mentioned he had, when he was here to speak previously, he mentioned that uh, it's sort of a war on drugs here. And they're trying to, the feds are trying to make as good an effort. They've uh, relaxed some of the regulations that Medicaid has on funding. Um, the Secretary of DHHR, uh, Bill Crouch, has already been utilizing some of those funds and being able to move them into other areas. We've had TANF funds that, were in a, that uh, haven't been completely used, and those monies are being used for child welfare and uh, child protection services. So uh, we are trying to maneuver some of that Medicaid funding. Uh, going toward behavioral health, uh, we have managed care organizations within the state that we've initiated uh, treatment and having uh, those cover, and that's mainly Medicaid uh, programs that cover uh, mental health. And then we're also looking into the foster care part too as far as potentially initiating that because that's another big problem with, with our drug problem because that relates to the, uh, the children. Uh, of some of these people that are that are addicted. There, there has to be more funding. I mean, again, over the past several years, in order to balance the budget, we've cut the DHHR budget by $186 million, and that impacts foster care and child protective services. And I see, as a geriatrician, a lot of grandparents raising these kids because their parents are either, you know, you know dead or uh, in prison. So I think funding is a huge issue. I think that we are really at a, at a critical time uh, with regard to uh, having children safe. I think that uh, a lot of my friends that work in this uh, arena say that, uh, you know, these kids are not getting the adequate care that they need and the foster system is, is broken and uh, that's something we really need to look at and it's a, it's a direct result of this drug epidemic. Now, talking about the stigma attached to it, can either of you talk a little bit about the science behind addiction? Many still believe that it's a matter of willpower. I'll start with you, Sander. Well, addiction or substance use disorder is a brain disease. It's a disease of the brain uh, that, uh, uh, that has to be treated as a disease. Uh, you know, some people uh, use the analogy of insulin to a diabetic is, uh, you know, medicine or narcotics or opioids to an addicted person. And uh, we need to really deal with that stigma that, uh, you, know, you, you know, people that are addicted or have substance use disorder do things that are not normal, but at the same time, uh, you have to treat it as a disease, absolutely. So what are your thoughts on law enforcement and going after those who will sell it? Delegate, I'll start well, with you. We, we have looked at different ways as far as uh, penalties for people that are trafficking drugs. We've looked at the ones, not necessarily the ones that are using drugs, because we're trying not to penalize people, but the people that are peddling those and moving them into the state, we've, we've been focusing on the past couple of years. Um, but really, it's more trying to get people into treatment and identify, and uh, that is one thing that we have a problem with from the state legally identifying people and uh, unfortunately a lot of it comes to when they either have an overdose and they're in the emergency room or by EMS. Uh, we are trying to work at uh, identifying those people uh, with non-fatal overdoses 
and then look at that as far as trying to get them into some type of treatment. Uh, DHHR is currently working on that and we have protocols on how to do that. The other part is from the penal system. You're going to get people in that and that's unfortunately, we're trying to do it before they get to that stage. Um, so early intervention is really the key. Um, looking at things such as social workers in the schools or something to identify uh, problems, uh, things like that are, are where we're trying to go because um, we hear from our schools that that's one of the areas that they feel that uh, uh, CPS should be able to get involved and identify cases where uh, children are at risk because of maybe other family members. Um, so it's really a matter of how do you attack it and how do you find these people. And we don't have the resources, uh, as the senator mentioned, financing is you know, always a, a problem. We have finite resources. And then the other part is really having treatment centers available throughout the rest of the state. We have them at major centers, but we don't have them throughout all the rural areas. Yeah. And people don't want to travel to the big cities just to get uh, treatment. Well, and the, you need the need for wraparound services as well, housing, education, jobs. There's obviously so much to talk about with this, but unfortunately we're out of time today. But thank you guys so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Anytime. As we wrap up this evening, please stay tuned to West Virginia Public Broadcasting as the opioid conversation continues on a PBS documentary called Understanding the Opioid Epidemic. Our problem here in West Virginia is a major focus in this national program, airing at 10 o'clock tonight and West Virginia Public Broadcasting will be bringing you original reporting throughout 2018 as we follow the efforts to combat our drug addiction crisis. For everyone here at the legislature today, I'm Andrea Lanham. Thanks for watching and we'll see you back here tomorrow night.